Father, we thank you for your great love in your son. We thank you for sending your son to be the sacrifice in our place so that we might be reconciled to you. And Lord, this morning as we now look at your word, I pray that we would have tender hearts, that we would indeed have eyes to see your greatness as we consider Christ. As we consider Jesus, who must be our everything. Lord, we need your assistance, and so we ask for it. We pray that you would be honored, that we would be grown and stretched, that our love would be deepened, that our affections would be strengthened. As we look at your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Right, please open your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Go ahead and open up your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 1. It has been said that a person is not ready to die, or not ready to live until they are ready to die. You could say it this way, that only once we are ready to die, are we really in a place that we are truly ready to live. And for many, this point doesn't come until they are on their deathbed, if it comes at all. And for some, it is only then at their last moments on this earth that they finally are ready to give their life to Christ. And only sadly, at that point, they have wasted their life that could have been lived for Jesus. Yet how wonderful is it for a person to come to the place that they are ready to die even while they have much time to live? You see, that kind of person who is ready to die is one who is ready to live, and that kind of person has a unique usefulness for the Lord. And really, the only true readiness to die can come to those who know Jesus. True readiness to die can only come to those who trust in the one who has conquered death. When a person is at that point of personal saving faith in Jesus Christ, he or she can face death fearlessly because they know that death is not the end. Death is not death. Rather, the doing away of this fleshly body will usher them immediately into the presence of Jesus Christ. And when one knows that this is the end, at that point, when an individual is completely freed and truly ready to live because they know the end. At that moment, one who knows the end is set and finished, that one can live every moment of every day. That is exactly where Paul is when he writes the Philippians. He's a man ready to die, and because of this, he is also ready to live if that is what the Lord has for him. In fact, Paul is so ready to die that he actually prefers death over life. Nevertheless, when he considers why it is better for him to live, namely for the Philippians, he's willing to live but eager to die and to be with Jesus. Paul is so consumed, he's so satisfied in Jesus, He's so captivated by the glory of Christ in the gospel that whatever the Lord has for him, he is content and he is satisfied. Most of us, if not all of us, I assume is wanting to live but willing to die. Paul was the opposite. Paul was willing to live but wanting to die. And the only way Paul could live this way is because of his his personal, deep relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus was his everything. Jesus was everything to him. The only way that Paul could live this way is because of his personal, deep relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only reason Paul could live this way is because he knew at the deepest conviction level that death was not the end for him. Death no longer held power over him. Death was not death, but rather a passing from this life to the next, which held for him Christ, who was Paul's greatest treasure. There was a satisfaction in Christ. 
in this sin-laden world and state that was so strong, Paul eagerly anticipated enjoying Christ in his passing into his presence. And Paul didn't find death attractive because he didn't like this life or because he felt sorry for himself. It wasn't a, a suicidal way at all. He simply wanted to be with his Savior. Paul treasured Jesus above all else. He wanted above all else what God is committed to. That is the glory of Christ in the gospel. And the Lord Jesus was everything to him, and he was longing to be with him. And death wasn't an obstruction to his agenda, but a pathway to what he longed for, which was to be with his Savior. You see, this passage is really the Everest of passages that launches us into glorious thoughts about the eternal state with Christ. For the believer, eternity awaits you. Jesus as the supreme treasure. That is how Paul thought, and that must be how we also think. So let's look together at Philippians 1. We're going to look at verses 21 through 26 this morning. Philippians 1, starting in verse 21. Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this? I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. All right, now here's the background of our passage. The year is 61 AD and Paul is imprisoned in Rome. He is awaiting trial before Caesar. And the charge is insurrection against the empire, and it is a capital offense. The reality for Paul is that his life very well may be taken from him through execution. Paul's not writing this book speaking about life and death as a hypothetical that, hey, we just, none of us know when our last breath may be. No, Paul... This is real for him. He is facing death. This is the rubber meeting the road in his life. This is revealing what is truly in Paul's heart. His desires are being revealed. His treasures are being shown. And what is on Paul's mind as Paul is in prison and awaiting his trial? What is on Paul's mind is the emperor will use his power to either take life or to spare his life. Christ. Christ. Paul knows that his future hangs in the balance, and as he sits in his prison, he writes this letter to the Philippians. For all, for all he knows, it could be the last letter that he writes. Yet he is a man at peace because he is living for Jesus Christ. And what is demonstrated here is the reality that in life or death, Paul loves the glory of Christ in the gospel. Paul loves the glory of Christ in the gospel. That's all his life was concern, concerned with. That's what he was always consumed with, was the glory of Christ in the gospel. The greatest treasure of Paul's, the greatest pursuit of Paul's life is the glory of Christ in the gospel. And here at the potential end, Paul's love for the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to three responses at his potential death. That's what we're going to look at this morning. First, Paul's love of the glory of Christ and the gospel led him to, number one, treasure Christ in life or death. Paul's love of the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to treasure Christ in life or death. Look at verse 21 again. Very simply, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was unwaveringly committed to the glory of Christ, and this led him to treasure Christ in life or death. If Paul was to live, it was for Christ, and if Paul was to die, it would be his gain because he would be with Christ. 
The focal point of Paul's life was Christ, and the focal point of his anticipation of death was Christ himself. Christ was everything to Paul. Paul spells this out even in more detail in chapter 3. Look at, turn over to Philippians 3. Look at verses 7 and 8. Chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Christ was not one among many priorities in Paul's life. Christ was the complete focal point and everything else in Paul's life, all of his pursuits, all of his accolades, all of his progresses, all of his life pursuits, he counts as loss to knowing Christ. And in comparison with Christ, all of those things are just rubbish. They're they're garbage. They're trash. Paul here is so emphatic that he says literally for to me or for me to live and he just says Christ the verb is is implied and that only drives home how emphatic he is about this reality as Paul's life is flashing before his eyes he is brought to the moment of considering time and eternity and Paul says everything that I have and everything that I am is bound up in Christ bound up in Christ. Christ is the goal of my life. Christ is the passion of my life. He's the pursuit of my life. Christ is the reason for my life. The sum and substance of my life is Christ. Every moment of every day, the very essence of my being is Christ. That is what Paul is saying here. Paul's entire life and reason for living is subbed up in this one word, Christ, in this one person, Jesus. Can you say that this morning with Paul? Is that your testimony? Not not that we're perfect or arrived, but that we can truly say this morning as a born-again believer that my life is Christ. Not Christ in sports, not Christ in work. Not Christ in money, not Christ in family, not Christ in relationships, not Christ in the approval of others, not Christ in self-image. There are places for many of those things where they can be good things, but not in as much as they compete for your affections with Christ. Everything, everything in our lives must center on Jesus. And at that point, at that moment, one is free to say, for to me to live, Christ. When Paul says to live is Christ, he is saying that all of his desires are consumed supremely in living for and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. For Paul to live is Christ, and yet he thinks beyond this life, and he says, to die, gain. When he says to die is gain, that that is a very much more desire. You won't have this desire unless you actually know him. No one can say to die is gain unless they know Jesus. That is the only way that dying can be gained. The only person who can say dying is gain is the person who can actually say living is Christ. Until Christ is everything in your life, this life, you won't have a desire for him to be your everything in the life to come. Why is dying gain for Paul? I want you to imagine this for a moment. A, a couple is about to get married. They're they're engaged and they're sitting down with another older, seasoned couple for premarital counseling. They're doing their premarital counseling. And can you imagine sitting down with someone who's engaged and asking them, hey, how is the engagement going? And the response is, oh, it's great. I love being engaged. Well, are you looking forward to marriage? Oh, yeah, 
that's fine. That's fine. We'll get there when we get there. I, I love being engaged. Engagement is the best. I want this engagement to last as long as possible. This is a great place to be. A, it, there's no better place than, you know, anticipating everything that will come with marriage, but not yet getting to have it. There's a special place for people like that. <laughs> Nobody says that. The whole point of the engagement is, should be to get to marriage as appropriately and quickly as possible. That's the greatest anticipation. Or how about this? You talk to a couple who's just a couple of weeks from being married and they say this, man, you've got to be, you've got to come see, you're talking to them, you say, hey, how's, how's it going? You're about to get married. Oh, it's, it's going great. You've got to come see the new house that we bought. This is the house we're going to live in. Well, great, but are you excited about being married to your spouse? Well, look at the backyard. It's beautiful. But, but what about the person you are marrying? Oh, and, you know, it's going to be really cool to share finances and have all those, you know, kind of things going on. But, but, but are, you, are you excited about the person you're going to marry? Did you see the new carpet? <laughs> no, those aren't the right answers. The right answer is yes. Yes, I am looking forward to being married so that I can be with the person whom I love. For Christians, this life from here to death is engagement. And so looking to heaven isn't to look to where we're going to be and all the things we're going to enjoy. It's to look to who we are going to be with. It's to look to the one whom we are going to enjoy for eternity. It's not about the experience. The experience will undoubtedly be amazing, but only because of the one who is there, who is the object of our desires. That is why Paul can say, to die is gain. To die, gain. Very much better. If I live in this life, it's it's great because I get to live for Jesus. But if I die, the one for whom I am living for every single day, I get to be with him forever. Most of us have it backwards. We think for me to live is gain and to die is Christ. And we couldn't be more wrong. If you're a Christian, you possess eternal life now in knowing God and the one whom he sent, that is Jesus. And so to live is to get to enjoy Christ, but oh, to live after this life, this one with Jesus, that is is not a consolation prize. That is the pinnacle. That is the, the very much more better to be with Jesus. There are things to enjoy in this life. Ecclesiastes calls us to enjoy under the sun things and we can do so in a more fulfilling way than anyone because we can do it as worship. We can do it as as Smed taught when he taught through Ecclesiastes with an over the sun or heavenly perspective and Christians should enjoy this world. No one can look at a sunrise or a sunset like Christians do and worship and thank and praise God. This life is a, is a great life to live, but it is temporary. It's temporary. I mean, less than 100 years versus eternity, temporary. And Christ, Christ offers what this world can never give you and what death can never take away. Christ offers you the only thing that will truly last into eternity, which is himself, a savior. To live is Christ. To die, it's gain. So Paul's love of the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to, number one, treasure Christ in life and death. And number two, Paul's love of the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to consider the implications of life and death. Number two, consider the implications of life or death. Look at verses 20 through 24. He says, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. 
But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the, the desire to depart with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. You see, there's an internal struggle going on within him. He, he's considering the implications. If I, if I live, this is what could take place. But if, but if I die, this is what would take place. He's considering the implications of life or death. And as Paul considers his life, he thinks about those implications. And in verse 22, he says, if he lives, this is fruitful labor. If his, is, if his life is extended from a human perspective, this will give him more time to preach the gospel. More people will get saved. More churches will be planted. More disciples will be trained. More young Timothys will be raised up. And what better fruit could there be than that? And so he says, if I live on in the flesh, this will be fruitful labor for me. And by re referring to remaining in the flesh, he's simply referring to the physical life where he is able to serve the Lord in the proclamation of the gospel and in the instruction and service of the church. What's interesting here is that Paul isn't seeing the positive side as living, as more time to enjoy things he thinks will give him joy. For example, he's not saying, well, if I live, maybe I'll find a wife and have kids, and that would be really nice. Or if I live, I can visit places I've always wanted to go, and that would be enjoyable. I, I can go places I've always wanted to see. He's not thinking, I if I live, I can build this tent-making business. I think I've got a corner on the market. I can be really successful. That would be great. No, when Paul considers the implications of living, he's thinking one thing, fruitful labor for Jesus. If I remain on in this flesh, that will mean fruitful labor. Fruitful labor for Christ. If he remains in this life, he can serve God's people, he can participate in God's work, and he's considering the implications of his life and death, and, and he's truly conflicted. Look again at the second half of verse 22. He says, I do not know which to choose. You see, Paul's at a T in the road, and he doesn't know which one to choose. The, the choice is not ultimately Paul's. His life will be in Caesar's hands. But even then, it's ultimately in the Lord's hands. But inwardly, Paul is conflicted. And in verse 23, you see he says he is hard-pressed from both directions. He's in a rock in a hard place. There is a, an internal turmoil for Paul as he considers these options. And, and, and it's actually a good place because it's, it's not that both options are bad, but both are actually good. To die is to be with Jesus, and that is amazing. But my life isn't my own. And, and to live means a benefit for my brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is a great option as well. And he says he has a desire to depart and be with Jesus. Again, we see that Paul wants nothing else than to be with his Savior. This is a strong desire, his supreme desire. He's ready to depart. He's ready to be with Christ. In Paul's mind, again, he, he says, this is very much better. But then he comes back, and he says, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul is resolved as he considers the implications of his life and his death to not only think about how it affects himself, Paul is thinking beyond himself. And as he considers his life and his death, he's thinking about the implications on others' spiritual good. Paul considers the implications of his life, and a major factor is that once he passes from this life to eternity with Jesus, he can no longer serve others the way he can now on this earth in Christ's church. For Paul, life would be a great outcome because of the positive impact on the believers around him as he selflessly gives of himself for the progress of the gospel and for the growth of the church. And yet to die, it would be the best case scenario. 
for, for Paul personally as he would be with Jesus. You, you see why it's such a unique place to be when you can say to live is Christ and to die is gain? If you stay and you suffer for Jesus, others will be blessed and built up. Christ will be glorified and honored. And if you pass from this life to eternity with Jesus, oh, that's very much better. One who truly embraces that reality, who can say that with full conviction, has a unique opportunity to be useful for the Lord in this life. In reference to his not remaining, Paul says it is very much better. It's the highest superlative there is for this. It's like saying to, to die is the best, better, bestest. Or, or to die, it's like saying holy, holy, holy in the sense that it is, it is, it is the best to the highest degree. Have you ever just paused and considered the implications of your own life and death this way? Have you ever just paused and thought, what do I think about eternity and what that will be like? Have you ever prayed prayers, God, help me to long for eternity with you more? Have you ever pondered and we'll talk about this more in a few minutes, but have you ever pondered, how have I positioned my life? And if my life were taken and I were to be with Christ, would that be the end of fruitful labor? Or did the beginning of fruitful labor actually never even start? Have you ever paused and just considered the implications of your own life and death? What are the conflicting things in your heart? We see how Paul is conflicted. Is it fear? Fear of what will happen to you? Fear of what your legacy would be? Is it regret? Maybe guilt? Or are you living your life in such a way? Are you experiencing the blessing of assurance of salvation to the degree that if you were to die, you know you would be with Jesus? And your life is structured in such a way that to remain, that's good for the body of Christ. Paul's love of the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to, number one, treasure Christ in life and death. And number two, Paul's love of the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to consider the implications of his life and death. And lastly, number three, Paul's love of the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to press on in life for the sake of others. Paul's love for the glory of Christ in the gospel led him to press on in life for the sake of others. Look at verses 25 and 26. He says, convinced of this, and that's that it would be fruitful labor, labor if he remains, convinced of that, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Verse 26 so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Paul is left with a dilemma of what he wants to do and what is more necessary at this time. It was better for Paul if he would depart and be with Jesus, but convinced that it would be better for the Philippians if he remained for their progress and joy in the faith. Because of that, he is convinced that he will remain. And so he presses on in life for the sake of others. He presses on in life for the sake of others. For Paul, what he desires to do most must yield to what is more necessary for the good of others and for the advancement of the gospel. What wins out for Paul in this moment 
is what is good for others. Paul considered his work for Christ to be infinitely more important than his personal longings. And get this, in this moment, his personal longings were the best personal longings one can have. What he desired most is to be with Jesus, and the best desire that he could ever have is to be with Jesus, yet he denies that in his own heart for a time. He is forcing within his heart a submission to what he knows, and that is my life is not my own, my life is Christ, and therefore if it is better for Christ's church that I remain, I want to remain. This isn't Paul correcting bad thinking. Paul has the right thinking here and his right thinking about the glory of Christ and eternity with Christ and how wonderful it will be to be with Christ. His right thinking about that actually led him not to feed his selfish desires, even though they're good desires for Christ, but to deny himself for the sake of others and to press on and to remain. Maturity in Christ longs to be with Jesus for eternity, and and maturity in Christ also includes being totally committed to serving Christ through the selfless service of others in the body of Christ. Every believer should live in this healthy tension that Paul is experiencing. Paul's consideration of the glory of God causes him to to long to be with Christ more than anything, but he's willing to postpone his trip to heaven in order to stay and serve the needs of the church. This is an act of self-denial and humility and putting others above his own longings. And the reason he does this is truly awesome. Look at verse 26. He says, So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. The the word order there is a little funny. Um, In the original, it's literally so that your proud confidence may abound in Christ in me. That's the order. That your that your proud confidence may abound in Christ in me. And the confidence that Paul instilled was one that found confidence through Paul in Christ. The way that Paul served didn't make people find confidence in, in Paul and Christ was off here to the side. Rather, the emphasis is on Christ himself, that the proud confidence fully sits in Christ, and Paul was an avenue to getting that proud confidence. The proud confidence came to them as Paul served them humbly, graciously, diligently, faithfully, and in his service, it built them up in their confidence in Christ through Paul. The confidence that Paul instilled was one that found confidence through Paul in Christ. Christ was the aim. Christ was the end. And Paul was Jesus' means in his faithfulness and service to growing the Philippians' maturity and joy in the faith. Paul's service of others was for the purpose of those whom he was serving, both being matured in holiness deepened in joy and grown in confidence in Christ. Paul is living out what he instructs the Philippians to in just a few verses. Look at verses 29 and 30 of chapter 1. Just a few verses down in in verse 29, Paul says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And then look at this, verse 30, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul tells the Philippians, they too have been granted to suffer for Christ's sake as he is suffering. Their future also is uncertain. They too are experiencing the same conflict in this life. And then what does he tell them to think on in light of this? Well, look at verse one of chapter two. Therefore, therefore, 
If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, which of course the answer to all of those things is yes, of course there are all of those things found in Christ. He says, verse two, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. What is that? Do nothing, nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he launches into this glorious explanation of the depths that Christ went as he humbled himself. No one started higher and ended lower than Jesus Christ. That is the kind of selfless service. That is what led Jesus to the cross. That is what brought about forgiveness of sins for all who would believe. That is what has reconciled you to God. That is what has given you hope in eternity. Jesus Christ has done these things. He is to whom we are to fix our eyes. He is to be everything for us. Everything is found in Jesus. Everything. Christ, Christ. Paul gives this instruction and listen, this, this pondering of his life and pressing on for the service of others, this, this is an example of Paul, but just shortly after, he's telling the Philippians to live this way. This, this isn't an example that, listen, elders, elders, I hope you're paying attention. This section is for you. Pa- the pastors need to follow this. Of course we do. But all of us need to live this way. This is, this is how all of us are to conduct ourselves. To press on in this life for the service of others. For whom are you pressing on in this life? Are you sacrificially living your life for the glory of Christ that others may be matured in Christ, deepened in joy, grown in their confidence in Christ? Do you treasure Christ? Is Jesus your greatest desire for eternity and your greatest joy in this life? body of Christ, his church is not something we attend on Sundays and simply Monday through Saturday get on with the rest of our lives. That's not God's intention. For the believer, Christ is their life, and in that, an unwavering commitment to his bride is shown in the selfless service of others. The body of Christ is not something that we squeeze into the cracks of our life. The body of Christ is not something we squeeze into the the margins, the small margins in our schedule. For the believer, we must think about our living in this world as a limited opportunity, which is a gift from God to give of ourselves in sacrificial service to others, for the progress of the gospel that Jesus would be glorified and his church would be matured. And once again, Paul's expectation was not that this is how elders, deacons should view things only. This should be the perspective of every every Christian. This should be your perspective if you're a Christian. Every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit, gifted for the better, betterment and edification of the body. You, regardless of your maturity, are gifted and are to both be grown in this church and be a means of growth for this church. And this puts the body of Christ, this puts church in such a a sweet light. You see, involvement in church is not something that is negotiable depending on how things are going in my life right now. 
No, because my life is Christ. To live is Christ. And because he was willing to be mocked, because he was willing to be ridiculed, because he was willing to be falsely accused and spat upon and pierced and nailed to a cross, being crucified, taking upon himself the wrath of God for all who would believe in light of him, I must walk in his giant footsteps seeking to die to my own desires in selfless service of others for the good of the church. That is the call for the believer. Have in you the attitude that was in Christ. He humbled himself to the lowest degree for all who would believe. I just want to commend you, Grace Bible Church, I want to commend you. So many of you serve both formally and informally. You embrace the ministries in this church. As I've studied this passage and prepared for this sermon, uh, it is something that we need to have in front of us, but not because there's an overwhelmingly lack in this church. You guys love to serve. You give of yourselves. You humble yourselves for the good of others sacrificially. That That is an overwhelming characteristic of this church. Very encouraged, very thankful. Your elders are so grateful for the way that this church serves and cares for each other. You embrace the ministries of this church with joy and zeal, yet this is such a good reminder for us to have our thoughts sharpened. To, to, to kind of reevaluate, re- take personal inventory of where are the adjustments? Where, where might we be drifting just a little bit in our thoughts about this church, in our thoughts about Christ's church? And so let's just think for a moment how, how do you view Sundays? Do, do you view Sundays this way? God has given me another day. Lord, please help my life today not be squandered, but let it be for the betterment of your church. Help me conduct myself in a way that it is a blessing to your people. And so when I walk in the doors, I've given thoughtful preparation to to look for people that might be on the fringe, to find conversations with people I don't know yet, to have an eye for the needs of others as I step into this building, to conduct my schedule throughout the week that I am well prepared to worship God on Sunday morning. Do you think about small group this way? There are many one another commands in small group or in scripture. Many one another commands in scripture and how this church has intentionally sought to go after many of those commands that are difficult to do all at once on a Sunday morning is in our small group ministry. What does your attendance to small group reflect about how you view small groups or or more importantly, maybe how you view the one another commands of scripture? What does your attendance to small group reflect about how you view small group in in itself? Is it something that you go to when it fits into your life? Uh, I'll I'll go to the Bible study when it works with what's going on, but man, it's just a really busy season, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a perpetually busy season. Is it something that you go to when it fits into your life? Or do you, for the good of your brothers and sisters in Christ, guard that time as much as possible that you could attend and step into those times with a heart to serve? Ready to ask good questions. Ready to share what God's been doing in your heart as you've been reading his word. Ready to share how you've seen God answering prayers. Ready to share those with whom you are proclaiming the gospel to, seeking to see come to Christ. Ready to share and confess the sin that you're struggling with and the practical steps of repentance that you're seeking to walk in. Are you ready to listen to your brothers and sisters to take good notes of how to pray for one another throughout the week? You could ask yourself that question about all of the ministries in this church. Build, Wellspring, 
student ministries. You really, we, we really should ask our question, that question of ourselves, not simply only in the formal ministries of this church, but what things have I committed to in my life that are keeping me from being able to be available to serve others in this body? And listen, if there is a hole in your thinking about serving others in the body of Christ, there most likely is a hole in your thinking about Christ. Because he died for his church. And if selfless service of one another here is not a priority, we are not looking at Christ well. That's why he came to earth. Lived the perfect life. It's why he allowed himself to be crucified. It's why he gave up his own breath and said, it is finished on the cross. It's also why he rose from the grave. He is everything. He has done it all. And this call to serve others isn't God calling us to give up what is good. This is God's desire for his people, which is good. This is the kind of living one can have when to live is Christ. Do you know Christ? Is living Christ? Or is to live anything else? If to live is anything other than Christ, your life needs to change. If you died today, do you know where you'd go? Would dying be gain for you? So we need everyone in this church, we need everyone in this church to be ready to die because it is only at that point that you are truly ready and free to live for the glory of Christ to its fullness. If the end is settled, you are free to live in such a way that prison is not a threat, that penalties or fines or the loss of privilege is not a threat, physical persecution or harm is not a threat because the worst thing that can happen to you is really the best thing. And anything that happens on this earth for the one living for Christ is all in accordance with God's perfect will to make you more like Jesus, to further his glory on this earth. And at that point, Christ is everything. And at that point, you can say, all I have is Christ. All of these other things, if they were done away with, all I have is Christ. And all of these things that I don't have, that others have, it's okay because all I have is Christ. All I want is Christ. All I need is Christ. Because Christ offers you everything in himself. This is the gospel of the glory of Christ that Paul was consumed with. Christ offers you everything in himself, in the gospel, eternal joy is before you. And listen, only a fool, only a fool would say no to forgiveness of sins. Only a fool would say no to mercy from God. Only a fool would say no to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Only a fool would say no to the hope of heaven. Only a fool would think that this life is gain only to find out that the next life is lost. Do not be that fool. If you do not know Jesus in this way that we see in Paul, if you don't know Jesus at all, if you have not repented of a life in rebellion against him and placed your faith in Jesus as the only acceptable sacrifice for your sins, I plead with you to do so. Repent now. Let today be the day when you can say, Jesus is all I want and Jesus is all I need. He has pulled me out of my darkness. He saved me. He gave me joy and peace. And most importantly, he gave me himself that I might know him, love him, worship him, and live for him. You see, the Christian life, the church for Paul, was not about building, it wasn't about activities, it wasn't about ministries, 
It wasn't about things. It wasn't about plans and agendas. It was about a person. Jesus Christ. For every single one of us, everything we do in this body must be centered on Jesus Christ. He must be everything. Heaven is precious because our Lord Jesus is there and we long not for that place but for the place where our our Savior sits and bids us come and longs for us to meet him. We must know Jesus, for in him is life, and in him death is sweet gain. Is that true for you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this sobering, convicting, wonderful example of Paul that we see in Philippians 1. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for making a way that we could know you and know him and have fellowship with you. We thank you for pulling us who have believed out of our darkness, out of our rebellion, out of our sinful hatred of you. We thank you for reconciling us to you that we can now have fellowship. And we thank you that you did not save us and simply leave us to ourselves, but that you were committed to your church, you are committed to your church, and you have saved us to a body. And Lord, we thank you, I thank you for this church. I could not imagine what the last 16 years of my life would look like were it not for the selfless, sacrificial service of so many faithfully serving, encouraging, praying for me and my family. Lord, help us to excel still more. Help us to think rightly about Christ. Help us to think rightly about this life. Help us to think rightly about death and help us to eagerly press on for your glory, for your namesake and the selfless service of one another. Help us to live our lives in such a manner that as an onlooking world looks at the individuals in this church, they see our love for you and they see our love for one another and they have no explanation. But that it must be you. And so, Father, we pray that you would indeed win our affections, that our hearts would be captivated, that our lives would be changed that we would live with intentional purpose for your glory in all things. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.